Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here, and I'm super, super excited to have one of my closest friends, Dr. Sarah Godfrey with. <laughs> Hi, and Alan, how are you? I am doing awesome, and I'm even better now to see you. <laughs> well, so good to see you. Hi, everybody. Nice to be with you. Now, I'm really excited. I put a lot of work into this book about resetting adrenals, and Dr. Sarah and I have been like talking back and forth for a long time, and we really think a lot of the same ways, and... I'm jazzed because she's got a book talking about additionally resetting other hormones and other steps you can take to help them further. And one of the biggest ones for, for many is estrogen and really getting estrogen right. And I was able to pull away a little of Dr. Sarah's time just to give you some heads up on some tricks that way and why that's relevant and maybe a few things you could do to get going on resetting your estrogen. Yeah, should we dive in? I, yeah. I could talk about estrogen all day and all night. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> well, maybe we should start first with what the heck it is, because both men and women have it. I think there's some demystifying that maybe needs to happen because a lot of folks just don't understand what it does in the body. But for women, at least, it gives you breasts and hips. It's responsible for some of your feminine qualities. And for men, they have far less in terms of the amount of estrogen that they have, but it's still important. It's in relationship to testosterone, but as men age, they can start to have too much estrogen. So the challenge here for most people is estrogen dominance and estrogen overload, having a little too much estrogen in the body. And that, that causes a number of symptoms. It can cause weight loss resistance. It can make you moody. It can make your breasts painful and cystic. It can give you cysts elsewhere can give you painful periods, endometriosis, the list goes on and on. But I've really found in my 25 years of practice that estrogen dominance is so common, you know, somewhere around 75 to 80% of women over the age of 35 have it. And especially when you're trying to lose weight, you, you want to pay attention to this hormone. And it's a big one in those ways. And you mentioned both genders. There's been more data on that. You know, men, men get breast tissue growth and we can get some of the same mood changes and cognitive changes. So it's, it's totally huge. And what are, some, what are some ways women might know if this applies to them? What are some key ways they might think about to know if this is really relevant for them? Well, I think, um, you know, for age is a big one. So, you know, just if you have an age that's 35 or older, there's <laughs> chance that you have a problem with estrogen dominance. And the reason I say that is because after age 35, and that's, you know, kind of a rough guideline, women start to make less progesterone. And so I'll back up here for a moment. Estrogen is really important to talk about in relationship with progesterone. They're kind of like tango partners. And <laughs> you want to have a really good dance between the two of them. And if estrogen is dominating, it just screws up the dance. So progesterone is um, kind of a counter to estrogen. Like in the menstrual cycle, for instance, estrogen leads to the growth of the uterine lining, and then progesterone helps you to um, kind of stabilize the lining and then release it. So they act in this, you know, sort of um, oppositional way uh, that also is quite harmonious. But what happens is you start to run out of ripe eggs, which happens in your 30s at some point. You make less progesterone. And there's other issues too. You know, you and I can't seem to have a conversation without talking about stress hormones and cortisol <laughs> and the adrenal reset. And one of the problems there is that cortisol is, you know, these hormones are not all created equal. And cortisol can um, block some of these, these other hormones. It can block your progesterone receptors. And it can um, kind of make your body create more cortisol because that's the priority, especially if you're under stress, at the expense of making progesterone. And so that can also contribute to estrogen dominance. So you asked me, Alan, Dr. C, about you know, how women could know if they have this. So the, birth, is the birth certificate is one easy test. Yeah, so birth certificate <laughs> is one. That was like the most long-winded answer you did in the short version. And another is, you know, just noticing some of these symptoms that you maybe struggle with. So 
breast tenderness, painful periods, heavy periods. That's a big one, especially for women in their 40s who are in perimenopause, um, flooding, uh, irregular cycles, um, and then mood issues. So depression, you know, feeling like you have PMS, feeling like you um, fly off the handle more easily than you used to. These are some of the common symptoms that I see. Another that are more science-based or require some testing include abnormal pap smears. We definitely see more atypia and abnormal pap smears in people who have estrogen dominance. So you could probably add to this list, Alan. I mean, the list is pretty long. So yeah, you'll hear about mood changes and anxiety, but um, and a lot with the symptoms, you're talking about paps and changes that way. Are there, what are some other ways that, apart from being a real nuisance, that this can cause longer term complications to your health? Yeah, so glad you asked about this. So the, you know, the big, women have this fear of breast cancer. So I wanna talk about that. You know, it, it's interesting as physicians because when I went through my medical training, I imagine this maybe was true for you too, Alan, I was, I was taught to really, you know, try to convince women that they need to address heart disease because that's the number one killer. And I found over and over again in the practice that I had that um, women were so much more concerned about breast cancer. Sure. So there's just something, you know, that's so personal about it. It's, it's, it represents who we are as women. There's psychological and spiritual aspects to it. So breast cancer is a big one. So what we're talking about here is not just a short-term problem in the balance between estrogen and progesterone. We're talking more about a long-term problem of estrogen pollution in the body that leads to weight gain, obesity, and also an increased risk of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, uterine cancer. Yeah, big, big stuff. There's this whole process of growth that we have that goes on and we can have healthy growth and healthy regeneration or we can have pathological growth. And these are growth and reproductive hormones in a big scale and on a small scale. <laughs> That's right. That's and the beautiful thing is right. prostate cancer. Yep. Yep. Same, same correlation. That's kind of like the male version of the breast tissue is the prostate. A lot of those same things show up. So the, the beautiful thing is you've got an awesome new book giving women more ways and how to fix this. And what are some super easy take-home strategies that someone could start on as, as they're waiting? Yeah, well, um, I've got an advanced copy of my book here, <laughs> The Hormone Reset Diet. And, you know, there's a couple of things that people can do right away. What I talk about in the first reset of my book, I've got these seven metabolic hormones that I want you to reset in three day bursts. So it's a 21 day program. And in the first one, I want you to go meatless. So this is pretty controversial at a time when paleo is very popular. <laughs> I, I love, I love that you're, that you're breaking out of the, the norm right now. That is so awesome. I just got to say that. I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate that because, okay, let me get super, um, vulnerable here because I went on paleo, you know, when I was struggling with my weight, I tried paleo and I, I gained weight. It was just too much saturated fat for me. I have all these cookbooks that have, you know, make a bacon cup. You like, you know, <laughs> it always involves bacon and, and these meats that are sourced from very healthy places, but it wasn't a good fit for me. And there's actually randomized trials showing that Paleo allows you to get to a certain body weight, a body mass index of about 23, but not go lower than that. And so I like to hang out with a body mass index of 21 to 22. That's where all my clothes fit. And I couldn't do it with paleo. It was just a little too much saturated fat. And what happens with a lot of people who go on paleo is that I think they focus on the meat, or at least this is what my husband does. He focuses, you know, he wants his steak and maybe a little bit of vegetables. <laughs> Three asparagus spears would be about right. <laughs> and that is not so good for you. That, so we know that meat eaters have higher estrogen levels. They're more likely to have estrogen dominance. It changes the set of bacteria that, in your, that are in your gut, which is known collectively as the microbiome, the set of bacteria, the microbes in your gut, and also their DNA. And there's even a subset of the microbiome, which I think is so exciting. I think this is the next 10 to 20 years of medicine, called the astrobolome. And this is the aggregate of microbes, including bacteria, that can control your estrogen levels. 
So you so, really can impact your estrogen levels with your fork. That's kind of the takeaway here. So this and, is a wild, this is a wild concept. I'd love you to go a little bit deeper on if you don't mind that you're wait, are we gonna geek out? <laughs> I Let's geek out a little it. bit. You know, we got some advanced <laughs> people here and you know, our Good. hormones, they're made and they're regulated in a lot of ways. And there's this hard data that what's happening in our intestinal tract may be one of the biggest variables in how our hormones are regulated. Yes. And this is a huge shift, right? I mean, you know, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was taught that it was controlled by the HPA, you know, the kind of this brain adrenal axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal thyroid gonadal axis, if you want to get super fancy. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the microbiome is actually controlling quite a bit of our hormone levels. And mm -hmm. this is a very interesting new area. So the point I was making was that meat is not always the best thing to focus on when it comes to trying to get healthy and lean in your body. And I think women are more vulnerable here. I think men, because of maybe the testosterone advantage and having lower estrogen levels, they can get away with eating more meat. And women are more vulnerable. So, so let me throw a little thing in here just quickly. So I went hardcore paleo for a couple of weeks, tried the whole thing, tried to go fat adapted. At the time, um, there was a course that I rode at our mountain home, and it was about a 20, 20 mile course, pretty big elevation gains at high elevation, you know, off road. And I could knock it out in like an hour and 10 minutes pretty consistently. So after a couple of weeks of <laughs> paleo fat adapted, you know where this goes. <laughs> I, I gimped and I killed myself just to finish the dang thing in two hours. Wow. <laughs> Okay, so this is this is how Alan tests different diets, right? He does <laughs> cycling and then yeah, like watts and watts and minutes and miles and you know <laughs> pretty objective stuff. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's uh, as you can imagine when Alan takes me on some of his extreme hiking, cycling, rock climbing. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes I'm doing yoga at the base <laughs> and waiting for him to come back. <laughs> You've always kept up and done great. <laughs> uh, not well in my own way. But so the so so going meatless is one of the strategies that I have been working with, and I've been teaching this for a number of years. I first taught this particular program in 2008 because I was trying to solve my own hormonal problems. And I've tweaked it over time, but the idea is this 3D immersion where you really address estrogen and its relationship to the estrogen receptor. So you go meatless, you increase the amount of fish and shellfish, omega-3s that you're getting, and you also get off of alcohol. Uh -oh. And this, this is the one that makes me a little bit less popular, but it's, it needs to be said because alcohol... Alcohol raises your estrogen levels, and if you tend to be estrogen dominant, it is adding to the problem. It slows down metabolism. It can clog up the liver, which is where, you know, it's kind of like the traffic cop in the body for all of your hormones. And it also raises cortisol, yeah. which, you know, here we go again. We can't have a conversation without talking about cortisol. So I, I, I'm not saying never drink again. I'm saying for 21 days, get off the sauce. <laughs> probably causing some problems in your body, especially with estrogen. That's, that's awesome. And, and this is the thing, just so you all are clear on this, that I don't know, I've, I've been, you know, Sarah and I have both been in this space, reading books, studying and researching working people for decades. And I don't know, 99.9% .9 of the stuff that you hear is copycat information. And that's not what Dr. Sarah is doing. You know, she's not just putting the stuff out that's in the last book that came out. This is, or from someone else, this is real in-depth, thought out, distinct content. And she's not afraid to really say what's been effective, what's working with what the science shows. And sometimes that means you got to ruffle a few feathers and Hey, that's what it takes. And that's, that's why we're really here fighting for your health and not afraid to do that. So kudos to you. That's really cool. Well, thank you, Alan. I, I appreciate that you always stand with me in terms of like, you know, standing up to the problems that are causing health issues for our people, whether that's, you know, the um, big chemistry and the endocrine disruptors that we get exposed to, or, um, you know, a problem with alcohol and how some people process it. Another issue that you and I 
love to talk about is fiber. I feel like fiber is sort of the unsung hero of the estrogen story. It does so much with many hormones, including insulin and cortisol. And it's, it's essential for your body to process estrogen, to use it as intended, and then get rid of it. That's really what you're supposed to do with estrogen. You don't want to keep recycling it in your body like bad karma. That's not a good thing. Yeah, how you're getting rid of it and what byproducts you're making out of it. The, it's all about the fiber and the flora. And also the wastes that accumulate in our bodies that further disrupt it. They're also impacted and brought out more effectively by that. So, yeah, cool stuff. So excited about the book. Uh, I've, I've had the luxury of seeing it beforehand, got to do a review on it, and totally love it. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's another perfect reset. And this is really the beautiful thing is that our bodies can reset. They can come back to a state of health and they can be thriving no time. Um, Dr. Sarah, any words of inspiration you'd like to leave everyone with? And well, I, I love how you are wrapping up on this concept of reset because I do think it's so hopeful. You know, it's it reminds me a little bit of when I turned 40. And I just, you know, it was it was such an interesting time because I, I was told I needed to lose the weight before I turned 40 because otherwise after 40, it's all going to come out of your face. And that's... <laughs> um, which is not really true, but I, I was scared into, you know, kind of getting to the weight that I wanted to get to before 40. But there's a sense of hope about 40. And I want to share that sense of hope because the cool part is that there's really rigorous science behind this idea of resetting. I first came up uh, against this data, kind of looking at the data when it comes to insulin, which is the second reset, which is to go sugar free. And with insulin, what got me so excited was that you can reset what I like to call the molecular sex between a hormone and its receptor. You can <laughs> reset in 72 hours. And so that's what got me going on these three-day bursts, which really is part of the physiology of resetting hormones and the receptors. So I think that's kind of the final point that I wanted to share with our listeners today. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I know you've got a lot to do getting ready for getting this message out for the world, but thanks for being with us and always a pleasure to see you. My pleasure. So good to be with you, Alan. Thanks everybody.